fine. I guess that would be fine. Thank you, John, for your opening presentation. Before I proceed to presenting uh, Dr. Shabir Ali, I would also like to mention I understand that this uh, debate is being live streamed. For those of you who are viewing online, you also have an opportunity to submit questions. You may submit them through the live stream chat, and uh, those will be collected by the end of the first break. I also wanted to mention, as you may have noticed, the time allotted to each speaker for their opening presentation is 30 minutes. Uh, at the conclusion, I will come up uh, when Shabir has finished his presentation uh, to make mention of our break and then the format of which we'll proceed involving the first response, second response, and then concluding reflections, which we then will have another break and a period of Q&A. Well, Dr. Shabir Ali holds a BA in Religious Studies from Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, with a specialization in Biblical Literature. He also holds an MA and a PhD from the University of Toronto with a specialization in Quranic exegesis. He is the President of the Islamic Information and Dawah Centre International in Toronto, where he functions as Imam. He travels internationally to represent Islam in public lectures and interfaith dialogues, and he explains Islam on a weekly television program called Let the Quran Speak. Please welcome Dr. Shabir Ali. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for that uh, warm uh, introduction and for your cheering. Thank you, uh, uh, Stephen, for uh, that generous introduction. And, uh, Thank you, John, for sharing this platform with me. And uh, I'm so delighted to, to be here with you today to present uh, my thoughts humbly on this uh, very important topic. As Stephen pointed out, and also John po pointed out, uh, it is a very important topic for Muslims and Christians to understand better. Uh, our event is billed as a debate. I wish it were billed as a dialogue, because I, I really uh, sincerely feel that we need to understand each other more, and uh, we will do that better through dialogue rather than debate. What's the difference? The, the word debate conveys to my mind that it's going to be proof and disproof. Somebody's trying to prove the other person's religion wrong. I would rather that Muslims and Christians together cooperate in battling many of the common evils that we face in the world. And uh, one of those, uh, from, from the point of view of faith, is non-faith. Uh, John, in uh, one of his recent uh, articles, uh, pointed out that uh, there is an alarming statistic of young Christians having doubts about the Christian faith. And I can confess that uh, it is alarmingly so as well among Muslims, that young people are questioning uh, their uh, faith. So what do we do in an atheistic world that is becoming increasingly atheistic and ungodly. Uh, I believe that people of religion need to band together and present a, a unified front uh, to deal with all of these challenges uh, to faith. Well, one of the ways of dealing with those challenges, uh, and this may be the positive aspect of our debate tonight, or this afternoon, is that uh, in, in such uh, occasions, we get a chance to think more rationally about our faith, as our faith is being questioned by the other side. And by thinking more rationally about our faith, we may, in the end, come out with uh, an approach to our faith uh, that is more rational and that will commend uh, itself more to our youth, whether they be Christian or Muslim. And in doing so, uh, we will be in a better position uh, to guard against uh, the onslaught, especially of the new atheism. Uh, one of the things that uh, the atheists uh, do question is the idea that God performs miracles. And in fact, uh, we do not need atheists to question that. Uh, we find that uh, many uh, Muslims and Christians as well are rational people, and they like to see everything done in a rational way. They, they believe that God does things uh, in a systematic and uh, a normal uh, manner, 
Uh, and by that we mean the manner that conforms to what people refer to as natural laws. And so when we speak about a miracle, uh, this naturally will be questioned, not only by atheists, but also by people of faith. Now, I, I customarily would have begun, and let me do so now, with praises for our creator and fashioner, the creator of the heavens and the earth. I ask you, God, to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets, his messengers, and all of the righteous people of all time, and on all of us here today. Now, I have invoked God, and here the atheist is not going to be very happy. But we're not here to please the atheist. We're, we're here to understand our faith ourselves. Now, uh, Muslims believe that Jesus was uh, one of the greatest men who walked the earth. The Quran, which is a Muslim scripture, uh, speaks of Jesus uh, in glowing terms and never criticizes Jesus, uh, from, at least from a Muslim point of view. Everything the Quran says about Jesus is positive. The Quran calls him by many uh, important titles. He is the Messiah. He is a servant and prophet and messenger of God. Uh, the Quran uh, gives us the story of uh, the Annunciation to Mary. And Mary says, how can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? And she's told, so it will be, because when God decrees a thing, he only says to it be, and it becomes. The Quran details some of the miracles uh, of Jesus, including uh, the statement in the Quran that Jesus healed the blind and cured the leper and raised the dead. And here again, obviously, uh, people uh, of the atheistic bent are not going to be very happy. Uh, the Quran uh, says that towards the end of Jesus' career, uh, there was an attempt to crucify him, and God rescued him and raised him to himself. Now, at least uh, Muslims and Christians uh, agree on one thing, and that is that God raised Jesus to himself. But uh, here, too, we must be more specific. Um, we are both uh, calling here uh, for a miracle, or we're identifying a certain event in our history uh, that we deem to be a miracle. Uh, but I will say that uh, Muslims have a certain degree of leverage in interpreting the Quran. Now, the Quran itself tells us that there are uh, verses within the Quran uh, which are very clear. These are referred to as the mother of the book. Where do we find this statement? In the third chapter of the Quran in the seventh verse. And at the same time, this verse says that there are other passages in the Quran which are not so clear. They are called in Arabic mutashabihat, which means that two different or, or sometimes multiple meanings can present themselves and one looks as good as the other. That's why they call mutashabihat. You can't distinguish uh, the, the truth of one from, from the other. So that means that there are passages in the Quran that lend themselves to multiple interpretations. And we see in the classical commentaries on the Quran, uh, I have Imam Habib here in, in the office, in, in, among the audience, and he can confirm this. This is what uh, all Muslim scholars know, that the classical commentaries on the Quran, written in Arabic uh, hundreds of years ago, even a thousand years ago, uh, give multiple meanings to various words of the Quran and to various passages of the Quran. There are also modern interpretations that may not have been so well considered in ancient uh, times. Now, we, we ask what modern uh, commentaries can be accepted? How do we distinguish? Well, we go back to certain basic principles. Uh, the first principle is that the Quran will interpret itself. So if something is not clear in one passage, it may be clearer in another passage, and that rules. We cannot give an interpretation of our own if the interpretation is already clear from the Quran itself namely from another verse that uh, we, we um, will now bring into consideration. Uh, if there is a clear statement from the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace, that would trump any other person's uh, statement. So the statement has to be clear uh, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says that this verse means that, uh, or he said something else which is so clear, and then it must be authentic as well, uh, because anybody could have said that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said X, Y, Z, but how do they know? Did they meet him? Uh, or if they're reporting from somebody else, did, are they reporting from somebody they actually met and who actually met the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace? So there, there's, there's a process of authentication of the statements. If there is, there is then a state, clear statement from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, that is authentic on the question, well, that rules. And I cannot stand here as a Muslim and give you a different uh, interpretation. 
Now we can go on, but uh, for a limited time, these are some of the most uh, important principles. Now when it comes then to the ascension of Jesus, uh, classical commentaries uh, said that God took Jesus, both body and soul, and raised him into heaven. Now this, the verse that they're looking at uh, in the Quran says, I'm going to raise you to myself. This is God speaking. And uh, the uh, great commentator on the Quran, Al-Imam al-Razi, said that it couldn't mean that he literally, that Jesus is being raised to God self, because God does not have a direction. Like we can't say God is literally up there. We say so for convenience and out of honor for God, like we look up in our prayer and so on. Uh, but uh, God is not to be said to be literally up there. And by the way, our up there is actually down there for uh, those who are in Australia. And uh, may, may God save them from the devastating effects uh, of the recent uh, fires. And of course, uh, this is a moment, as we recall, uh, for us to pray for people who are suffering all over the world for various reasons, especially those who recently died in the uh, air, airplane tragedy in Iran. Uh, so, uh, Muslims then, uh, looking at this uh, passage, they, they have some scope for interpretation. Uh, whereas the classical commentators would have said that God raised Jesus' body and soul into heaven, uh, modern Muslims may think that God raised the soul of Jesus because that is what is actually important. The, the body for Muslims is not so important, this physical body of this life. In the life hereafter, God will give us new bodies that are suitable uh, for the life hereafter. So Jesus may have been raised uh, spiritually. And uh, in that case, we can look at the gospel according to Luke, where Jesus uh, is reported to have said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And Jesus was on the cross, the gospel of Luke says, and before he died, this is what he said. Now, Muslim commentators on the Quran uh, often said that Jesus did not die on the cross, and uh, God put him to sleep and took his soul. Uh, and some said, of course, body and uh, soul. Uh, we can understand then, uh, a Muslim can take this position, this is a possibility for a Muslim to say, well, there it is, right there and then, God took the soul of Jesus, put Jesus into a sleep, a deep sleep, so that he appeared to be dead, and uh, everybody proclaimed that he was dead, but God has his own way of rescuing Jesus and raising him uh, to himself. More needs to be said about this, but I must uh, continue for a limited time, and more details can come out in the, in the Q&A and in response to uh, the questions that will be raised by my good friend uh, John Tors. Another important consideration among Muslims is uh, a passage of the Quran in the fourth chapter, the 157th uh, verse, which says, uh, they killed him not, nor did they crucify him, but so it was made to appear to them. Classical Muslim commentators almost unanimously said that this means that Jesus was not even put on the cross. Here they took the, uh, the term crucifixion in its most literal sense possible. They gave it every possible meaning. Crucifixion can mean two things. One, it can mean hanging a person as, as, as a means of executing him, regardless of whether or not the execution uh, was actually successful. So the mere act of hanging the person could be called crucifixion. Where do we see a meaning like this? In Mark's gospel, when Mark's gospel says that it was at the third hour when they crucified him. It doesn't mean that he died in the third hour. It means that that's the, the hour when they hung him on the cross. So merely hanging a person on the cross is called crucifixion. But crucifixion uh, also uh, can be used in hindsight about a person who was executed by that means. When, for example, a Christian says, Jesus was crucified for our transgressions. The Christian does not mean that he merely hung on the cross. The Christian means that he hung on the cross until he died. So then, crucifixion, you can see, can have two basic meanings, whether we're speaking English or Arabic or Greek or uh, Hebrew or some other language. Uh, one meaning is the person merely hangs on the cross. 
without any commentary on whether he dies or not. Uh, second meaning, the person hangs until he dies, and that usually is the intention behind uh, crucifixion. So when the Quran then denies that Jesus was crucified, when it says, ma kataluhu, they did not crucify him, was the Quran denying both meanings? That's what the classical commentators said. But I will submit before you humbly that it does not have to deny both meanings. The Quran could be denying the second meaning, the idea that they crucified him until he died. And the Quran is not necessarily denying the idea that Jesus hung on, on the cross. If we allow for the possibility that Jesus was put into a sleep, into a coma, those state by God, and under God's supervision, he was brought down from the cross, preserved, and then eventually his body was raised into heaven uh, where it is preserved and where, from where Muslims believe that eventually uh, Jesus will come back uh, into, uh, to earth for a second uh, time. Now, of course, many Christians will be listening to this and saying, well, wait a minute, our Gospels do not allow for that. Our Gospels say that Jesus actually died. And, and, and John uh, Torres did give an able defense of that position, that it, it's clear that Jesus died according to the Gospels. But I'll come back a little later to examine that idea a little bit more carefully to see if indeed there is any possibility for Muslims to look at the Gospels and say, well, wait a minute, it looks to me that even though the Gospels are saying that Jesus died, and even though this was a widely uh, proclaimed uh, testimony of uh, many early Christians that Jesus died, uh, perhaps he didn't actually die. I, I will have to come back to that point. But uh, for the moment, I wanted to put before you that Muslims are not approaching this from the point of view of atheists or disbelievers. Muslims are approaching this from the point of view of how do we defend Jesus in the light of non-belief. Now let me uh, explain that a little bit further. The Christian story in the Gospels say, uh, the Christian stories say that uh, Jesus was crucified under the Roman authority, Pilate, and everybody knows that crucifixion was a Roman form of execution. But nonetheless, the Gospels place the blame for Jesus' death squarely on the Jews. Historians look at that now, and they say that these Gospels were written in hindsight by Christians at a time when it would not have been popular for Christians to oppose the Roman government. In fact, in the New Testament itself, they said a lot of things to placate the Roman government. We find this in the, in the writings of Peter and in the writings of Paul, for example. So that even though the Roman government had recently crucified Jesus, here we have Christian writers praising the Roman government as an agent of God, enacting justice on behalf of God. So on the one hand, there is a need to placate the Roman government, and, on, uh, and so the, uh, the, the, the Roman government is exonerated in this whole scenario of the crucifixion of Jesus. And on the other hand, there is a tendency uh, to blame the Jews. And so... With these two points in mind, the crucifixion comes across in the Gospels as the work of the Jews. They bent and twisted the arm of Pilate and made sure that Pilate crucified Jesus, even though Pilate was reluctant to do that, and he even washed his hands in public of the whole affair. So the Romans uh, exonerated, the Jews implicated. The Jews came up with their counter-narrative, and this is mentioned in the Babylonian Talmud in Sanhedrin 43a. This was uh, brought to uh, my attention in an article uh, by Ian Meverak, writing in the Journal of Religion and Society. Ian Meverak says that when the Quran says, they killed him not, nor crucified him, the Quran is responding to the Jews who, in the Babylonian Talmud, took full responsibility for crucifying Jesus, but with the addition that they are claiming that they were right to do so. They said that they charged Jesus with sorcery because he was doing acts of black magic and, and, and sorcery and witchcraft. And the penalty for that is death. 
And while he was under this charge, they put out an open proclamation for anyone who had anything to say in Jesus' defense to come forward. And they would have halted the proceedings to crucify him, or rather to, to stone him, because that was their method, not just to crucify, but to stone. They would have halted the, the proceedings to stone him at any moment had anyone come forward with any viable defense of Jesus. And even as they were leading Jesus out to be stoned, they said that if he himself protested and he had anything reasonable to say, they would again stop and listen to him and give him a fair hearing. So from the Jewish point of view, according to the Babylonian Talmud, they did everything that is right according to their law, which is God's law, according to them. And they, yes, they killed him, they're saying, but we did everything right. And by killing him, they want to imply that he is the false prophet, he's the false messiah. So it's with this in mind, according to Ian Maverick, that the Quran says, no, they didn't kill him. And they didn't even crucify him. So the Quran is defending Jesus against the accusations of the Jews in the Babylonian Talmud. And I say Jews here not to generalize. We don't mean all Jews of all time. We're talking about those Jews in the time of the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace who were making this claim. And the Quran is answering their claim. So then we realize then that the Quran is not saying that Jesus was not crucified. The Quran is saying they, the Jews, did not crucify him. So whether we're looking at the Babylonian Talmud, which says that they killed him, the Quran is saying, no, they didn't kill him, or we're looking at the Christian Gospels, which say that the Jews are responsible for crucifying Jesus. Now the Quran is saying, well, no, they didn't crucify Jesus either. And historians come away from this saying, well, well you know what? The Quran is technically correct. Jeffrey Parander, a Christian writer, in his book Jesus in the Quran, says that the Quran actually is correct because crucifixion was a Roman punishment and it's the Roman that crucified Jesus, not the Jews. So when the Quran says that the Jews didn't crucify him, the Quran is correct. The Muslim commentators took it to mean that he was not crucified at all. And this has become a general understanding among many common uh, Muslims. But it is not a necessary understanding from the Quran itself. So now, Having laid out the Quranic ground, uh, sub to some items which I must return, I want to turn uh, to look at the Christian uh, position regarding this and how uh, this may be uh, approached. When we come to a debate like this, we must understand the uh, neutrality that we must bring to it. If I am saying Christians, you must believe in what the Quran says, I must first present good reasons for why you should believe that the Quran is the word of God. Otherwise, why should you believe the Quran? Now, it so happens that I'm not asking Christians tonight to believe in what the Quran says. I'll be asking Christians actually to look more carefully at their gospels to see if there is something that was actually missed previously that you need to take into consideration. So I'm not asking Christians to believe in the Quran. So I don't need to present the Quran as the word of God and arguments for the Quran as the word of God. Likewise, if Christians want Muslims to believe in the gospel narratives, they may have to present evidence that the Bible is the word of God. Now, now John rightly presented not the Bible not as the word of God, but as ancient testimony. And so he presents natural, historical pieces of evidence to prove that this is ancient testimony. So he's on the right track. He's not saying this is the word of God, therefore you must believe it. In it. If he's going to say that, then obviously you have to present evidence for that. Now we come to burden of proof. Uh, the, the title of a debate is worded just as you see it there. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Now this presents to Christians uh, the, the burden of proof. They have to give solid and good evidence to show that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And it's not necessary for the Muslim to prove that he did not rise from the dead. The Muslim only has to question the positive evidence and say, well, wait a minute, that evidence does not actually add up. There, there is another reason outside of debate that Christians have a burden of proof in this matter. You see, the, the, uh, the New Testament presents Jesus as having died under the curse of God's law. Christians tell us, and Christian apologists generally say, that 
if Jesus was crucified and that was the end of the matter, this would prove that he's a false prophet, false messiah. He, he's, he died under the curse of God's law. Uh, because Paul said anyone who hangs on a tree uh, dies in a cursed death, according to the book of Deuteronomy. I believe he misunderstood that passage, but nonetheless, this is how the matter stands. So now, think about it. Jesus dies publicly, and this means that he is a false prophet. But, a few days later, he arises from the grave, and this proves that God has vindicated him, and God is with him, and he is a true prophet and messiah of God. But this is a private affair. Jesus appears only to a few people, even if we count the 500. But I'll question the 500 later on. But uh, uh, Peter, in, in the Acts of the Apostles, says that Jesus did not appear to everyone. He appeared only to those who had come up with him from Galilee. So chosen disciples and followers. In that case, it's a public demonstration that Jesus is a false prophet, but then there is a private vindication showing that he is the true prophet and true Messiah of God. So now Christians, those who are privy to that private vindication, they have the responsibility to go convey to the world the proof that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Because the world, knowing that Jesus was crucified, should conclude, according to Christians, that Jesus was the false Messiah. Until they come to know of good evidence showing that Jesus actually rose from the dead. There's another angle to this. The, the Gospels go out of their way to show that Jesus uh, was the Davidic Messiah. He was the son of David, he's, and so on. Now, what was the Davidic Messiah? The Davidic Messiah was to uh, overturn Roman rule and institute the law of God on the land. What Muslims call the Sharia, or the law of God, Christians also had that concept, although generally it doesn't seem so that much anymore. But Christians still, in their prayers, the Lord's Prayer says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They want, at least this prayer is announcing, that we want the law of God to be executed here on earth as it is already in heaven. So that it's the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Rome or, or some other kingdom. Well then, if Jesus was the Davidic Messiah, then he had to overthrow Roman rule. And the Jews can say to Muslims, well, wait a minute, you say he's the Messiah, but he didn't overthrow Roman rule. And Christians will say, but wait, when he comes back, that is when he will rule. That is when he will be a king. And the Jews will say, well, okay, so when he comes back, we'll see that he's a king, and then we'll know that he's the true Messiah. But for the moment, it looks like he's a false Messiah. He claimed to be a king, but he didn't actually turn out to be a king, so therefore he's a false messiah. So now, Christians, by proving that Jesus resurrected from the dead, will be proving that God is still with him, despite the way it looks. But, of course, Christians would have to prove that, and hence the important concept of the burden of proof. I'm running out of time, but let me go through very quickly and mention a few points. Uh, I'll skip past this, uh, because I basically explained this, the Quranic position. I want to say something about the evolution of the Christian texts uh, and, and beliefs. Uh, there's an important book written in the field called The Evolution of the Word um, by Marcus Borg, the late Marcus Borg. And, and he showed how, as we go from one gospel to another, the story about Jesus changes. And I think this is a very important thing that we have to look at tonight. So we have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and John. And uh, it is generally understood, uh, even by what uh, John uh, presented, John Torres presented, John is the last of the four Gospels. Not only is the last of the four Gospels, but John is a different Gospel. And the other three are very similar. They're called synoptic Gospels. We'll come back to this and explain in more detail, but I'll go through quickly. Now, uh, scholars believe that uh, Mark was the first of the four Gospels, and that Matthew and Luke were dependent on Mark, they actually are, in a way, rewriting Mark and expanding the story and make it, making it more Christian as we go. And uh, if these are dates that are commonly accepted 
uh, in the scholarly world, but uh, John Torres has presented uh, dates that are uh, held by only a few scholars nowadays, uh, very conservative fundamentalist, uh, liberalist uh, scholars. I don't say these uh, to demean the, uh, the, the scholars, but I'm just, just to identify so you, know, you understand. Most academics uh, would say that this, uh, these are the dates. And, and John written about by the close of the first century, around 100. And we can see that as we go from Mark, the earliest, to John, the latest, uh, the, the proof that Jesus rose from the dead is greater. The proof that he actually died is greater, including that spear thrust, which is mentioned only in John's gospel. Remember John Torres was making a big point about the spear thrust, which would have proved that Jesus died? That's only in John's gospel in the last of them. So as we go from the first to the last, the number of witnesses who are there increases so to the extent that in John's gospel, we have a witness right on the, at the cross itself, and that's the very witness who is, is apparently is claiming to be writing this last gospel. Whereas in the other Gospels, the uh, disciples forsook Jesus and fled. But in John's Gospel, this faithful disciple is right there. In fact, in modern times, scholars question whether that disciple actually existed. And the one who is called the beloved disciple in the fourth Gospel does not seem to be mentioned in the other Gospels. And it, uh, Andrew Lincoln, in his commentary on, Mark, uh, on, on John's Gospel, uh, does raise this point that it looks like this is a literary device that the writer of the fourth Gospel is uh, using. He is writing about a fictitious disciple that is called an ideal or beloved disciple to show Christians this is how you're supposed to be. Not that this was an actual uh, factual person who existed and lived and walked and heard what Jesus uh, preached. Much more needs to be said about this, uh, but uh, I, I want to bring it to a quick close. Uh, and in closing, I want to recap uh, where we have gone with this uh, opening presentation. So first I have shown that uh, Muslims and Christians have to work together at this. I do not come at this from the point of view of let's uh, uh, disprove Christianity and prove Islam to be right. I come at this from the point of view that we Muslims and Christians together have to understand our faith better and present it in a way uh, that it will be understandable and respected by our youth first, and that we can present to the world at large. Thank you all very much.